if you want a church of mature adults tomorrow, you need to invest in the young adults today. So if you want a church that knows how to function in the next 10 years, 20 years, you got to be able to teach them and train them and disciple them today. This is the Young Adults Today podcast. It's fall, y'all. That means pumpkin spice lattes. That means fall launches. That means starting up new young adult ministries. We pray they're successful. Let us give you a free resource. It's our ebook by Micah Kennelly and I called 10 Steps to Starting a Successful Young Adult Ministry. It's free at the website youngadults.today youngadults.today the link is in the show notes to the free ebook our gift to you and this is a podcast on young adults today where we talk about the faith of the next generation we interview thought leaders pastors and authors theologians apologists and generational researchers about the faith of the next generation we're fanatical about reaching young adults in our world today and specifically reimagining what it could look like to reach young adults in our world today in your community. So if you're not subscribed, do that. That way you'll never miss great conversations with guests like Hunter Perry, who's the pastor of young adults at Rock Point Church in Queen Creek, AZ, Arizona. What's up, man? Oh, nothing, man. I'm good. How are you? We're doing great and so thrilled to have you. So Mr. Perry will be joining us today. And he is one of our friends, actually, that we've Met Josiah, you met him. Where'd you guys come across each other's paths even? Gosh, I've been coaching communities. Yeah, we've done coaching communities together. Um, and we have a couple mutual friends who put us in contact. But fun story Uh that I'll share is I was on a layover (laughs) in Arizona and Hunter and I got to hang talk baseball. Dude, we saw cars that drive themselves in Arizona. You're on a field trip, it sounds like. (laughs) Oh, it was. Took I took Josiah to this coffee shop in Phoenix called Lux, which is like just one of the go-to spots if you're there. And then uh, literally we went to like a taco place. That's it's the best taco place in Arizona. And we probably probably saw eight Waymos driving around all by themselves in 30 minutes. It was crazy. I Waymos and explain what they are to somebody like me from maybe the Midwest who doesn't (laughs) know what a Waymo is. And tie it into the future, man. <laughs> Where's our world uh, going? Yeah, I mean, it, it is kind of crazy. They are these like artificial intelligence vehicles that have this like GPS scanner on top of them that's just continually rotating. And I don't know if Google uses them to like do their maps and whatnot, but they literally drive them themselves and you can actually like uber in them so you can download the app and waymo and so you can get in this car in the back seat and it will drive you to wherever you need to go um i really don't know i think honestly if i was to segue this into where the future is going uh it seems like we love to piggyback on what ai is doing without fully understanding it so my buddy uh my buddy kurt who we're really good friends he's actually a, a pirates fan so i wore the hat today for him go paul skeens um he's on fire but yeah, he is. But he, he he downloaded the app and was like, I'm just going to go in one and see what happens. And he wrote it like 10 times. But uh, um, I don't know, with AI and where we're going, it, I think it is going to take us places that we're not fully sure of. And we're kind of, sort of blindly trusting for most of the population. So, But hey, I love ChatGPT. It gives me great jokes when I ask for them and, uh, you know, decent commentaries every now and then. So. <laughs> yeah oh my I don't gosh. Know. that's it sounds more like a field it's trip okay. that you would just go in that type of vehicle like our kids would want to go in it can we do that sure. again it's like when you go on escalators can we do that again i'm like honey this isn't a ride like we're on a mission here so i don't know if i want somebody blindly leading my missions though but we know that we serve a god that we get to team up with where we don't necessarily always know where we're going or what we're doing or how we're going to get there and maybe for some of us who don't know your story, Hunter, how did you get to where you are today? And what is a little bit of your life journey? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, like you said, I'm the young adults pastor in uh, Queen Creek, Arizona at Rock Point Church. Um, but I originally was born in Oklahoma. I lived there for uh, 20 years and uh, I got to go to a Christian school growing up and started my foundations of faith really young. Um, it's awesome now being in school uh, for 
or like theology stuff in like our class, we had to talk about it. I think I started learning like hermeneutics and like biblical studies in as like third grade, just because that's just how my school operated back then. Um, it, but it was cool. Like from from a young age, I started to learn a lot about faith and um, started loving the church. My first pastor, um, his name is Ryan Golightly. He's still my mentor today. And so getting to have relationships from really, really young on was really awesome. I grew up playing football my entire life, and my dream was to go uh, either play in college at what was Oklahoma State uh, for me at the time. In my brain is where I thought I was going to go. That's where my parents went to school. Um, but then I got converted to the dark side, and now I'm a Sooners fan. Um, so I don't know how that happened, but I think it's because I had like four buddies go play for the Sooners and not Oklahoma State. So I switched alliances on my family. They're not super over it yet, but that's okay. Um, so I, th I thought I was going to go play football and I eventually did get the opportunity to do that at a school called Oklahoma Baptist. And I played there for two years. Um, but in my junior year, I had stepped out of playing football and I got a call from a pastor out here in Arizona and he asked if I wanted to come and check out the church for a conference. So I did. And in that summer, like right before school was ending, he offered me a job to come out and be like their students guy. And I was like, what in the world? Like, I'm not even done with school. And I don't know if he knew that. I wasn't going to tell him that I wasn't done with school because <laughs> I just got a job offer. Um, but for me, I was like, I don't know really what I'm supposed to do. And I started feeling like kind of anxiety, like I'd never lived anywhere away from my family. Um, and so this was a big move if I was going to do it. But starting from there, really what I and my grandma really has always told me my whole life is just to follow peace. So I just kept asking God, like, God, give me peace in whatever decision I'm supposed to make. So um, I kept asking for that. And I honestly kind of felt anxiety about staying in Oklahoma. And I felt peace about going to Arizona which was ironic because the church that I moved out to take this job, I eventually left after like a hundred days. I resigned my position and we like love the church, love the people, um, incredible community. But for some reason, God had me at another church, uh, which was rock point. So now I I've been at rock point since, uh, January of 2020 and have, you know, rode through the waves of COVID with these guys and been a part of the young adult ministry for a little over a four years now. So and it's been a wild journey. Um, but I love getting to be where I am. Met my wife here and she's our middle school director. So we get to do ministry together and it's it's really awesome. The answer to your question, I think. Yeah, oh, that's great. hundred percent, man. And yeah, I I we're gonna get in to talk about Rock Point Young Adults, Young Adult Ministry specifically, but you're Gen Z, right? I am. Yeah. Okay. So I'm a millennial and I have thoughts about AI. Um, we can share them, but we, you went there with the Waymos and yeah. What is somebody, cause you know, you're Gen Z leading Gen Z. It won't be long. And the alpha gen will be in mm -hmm. our college and young adult ministries. Mm -hmm. Um, it, like what are your thoughts on AI? I don't know. I'm always like a, proponent of technology i love it like uh we see so many cyber trucks driving around like arizona and queen creek and every time i see one i like freak out i love it and then my wife is like that's the ugliest thing i've ever seen um but they're just they're new and they're different um but i've always loved it i've always been a fan of where technology is going um and I, I honestly kind of love the idea of chat GPT and all of like what is accessible to us. I think it's helpful in some ways. I think where I've seen it and possibly am seeing it going into the future being somewhat hurtful is I think it will replace some of our critical thinking. I think it will replace our hard work. I think it can replace um, the drive and internal of like, I'm going to figure this idea out on my own instead of trying to find it in some sort of like artificial intelligence. Um, and I also think if we're not careful, we can almost lean on it to do almost kind of ministry in a way. Like you can literally go on chat GPT and ask you to write a sermon and it'll write you a pretty dang good sermon. Um, but I think the cool thing and something that we need to, to realize is that AI will never be led by the spirit. It just won't. Now, can God use it? Sure. I mean, 
I, but again, like Theo, I mean, he's always empowered people and I don't know uh, if he'll empower AI in the same way that he'll empower people. So um, yeah, those are my like in, initial thoughts. So I like the idea of it. Um, I think it'll be beneficial, but I don't know if it'll be like what well, we should, you know, put all of our chips into that basket of where, because again, I don't know, really know what, where it's going to go. For sure. Yeah. I love it. I love that you said that it's it's never going to replace the Holy Spirit. I think that that is the key component of which you said. Like, I think there are there's positives to anything, anything, and there's negatives to anything as well. So to walk that fine line as ministry leaders, as people who are prepping and being in the throne room of God, like, the, yeah, AI is not going to be in the throne room of God hearing the voice of the Lord or feeling the promptings of the Holy Spirit. And I think that we can't neglect the Holy Spirit in the process of quote unquote building a ministry that God's asked us to build. So I don't know. That's what I would, I just love that you had set, had went there and that's how you worded it. It was perfect. It's it's fascinating man, because we'll I'll talk to some high school students and they'll share about who are Christians by the way. And they're, they'll share about like what public high school is like and how maybe all of their friends or teammates They'll use chat GPT to write their paper, run mm -hmm. it through a different word scrambler, and then run it through another recognition software to test to make sure that it can't tell that chat GPT um, made this paper. And, <laughs> you know, so I, I was fascinated by that. And I'm like, well, how long does that take? And, you know, I, I think to the Waymo part, the reason I brought it up is the future, you may or may not need a driver's license. And, yeah. you know, so there's, there's just the world could look different, but I think that what are we willing to surrender at the same time? And I, uh, I, I always like to just hear where people are at with it. I am fascinated or curious about AI, just like I am with a lot of things, but I think at the same time, there's a, a little bit of reservation that I hold just as far as like, you know, um, I think if you're going to repurpose some things on purpose to me, that sounds like, okay, if we have this podcast conversation and, and we already put in the work, we wrote questions for you. We talked, we, we had the conversation and then say later, we wanted to run that through, you know, some sort of a transcribing software. I don't see an issue with that because that's mm -hmm. our primary work. And then we're repurposing the clips or the, the transcription. And maybe that could be a blog post or social media or a book. I don't think that's wrong in repurposing on purpose. But I think if instead, can you just imagine the level of conversation if we hooked up and today's the guest is chat GPT? And chat GPT is going to, you know what I mean? Th that's just yeah. different than hearing what God's doing in your life. Haven't we learned anything from Hollywood that technology always takes over and never turns out well? Exactly. <laughs> no, exactly. If I'm not mistaken, I think that movie I robot was set in like 2025. So uh, I don't We're know if you remember it. that Will Smith movie, but it's next year. So uh... we'll see what happens. <laughs> we have way more problems now, but man, yeah, I, us... I'm with you. I, no, like, go ahead. Go, I, go. I, yeah, I, I just I think like if you look at the just in history, especially with the church, like we've had to adapt in so many different ways with so many new technologies and things. I mean, before the 20s, like we like and did like 1900s, there weren't cars like they didn't have like any ability. We were like all horseback riding, like if we wanted to go anywhere. And like with the invention of cars, we were able to adapt and planes and all of that. We've So I think like. I think it'll be beneficial for us, but I, I, I did hear about this, uh, church. I think it was in Germany that did their whole service AI and like message worship, everything. They just did it AI and like no shade or anything like that. I, again, like well, to what you were saying, Mike, like, I just don't know if that is as effective as, you know, a person led by the spirit um, but like you said, Josiah, I think if it helps you be efficient and really effective in what you're doing, then I feel like that's what we're supposed to, supposed to use as a tool. It's like using a commentary for a message. It's like all the church history that we've seen for the past. So, um, if it's helpful, use it, but if it's replacing you doing hard work, I don't think you should probably do that. Spot on. 
So good. <clears throat> and it kind of leads us to why, Hunter, we ask every guest on this podcast why they believe young adult ministry is so vital. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, there's so many answers. I, I think the most practical one is if you want a church of mature adults tomorrow, you need to invest in the young adults today. So if you want a church that knows how to function in the next 10 years, 20 years, you got to be able to teach them and train them and disciple them today. Like how we, we talk about our young adult ministry here is, and it's how I talk to any leader I'm recruiting or, or talk even just to our young adults. And I try to speak it over them, almost giving them vision of like, this is not your church tomorrow. This is your church today. And what we're doing is to help you be able to function in society and church and like carry this thing and run, run this thing. Um, Cause it's not even like, it is the future church of like tithing and giving and serving. Um, but we really need to make sure that we are pouring into them and really highlighting young adult ministry. Cause uh, if we are not careful, the young adults will find places that, uh, you know, they will go to find feelings of being known and seen and heard and accepted. And we see that in culture today. Um, you know, there's a lot of people doing a lot of things that uh, may help them feel accepted and known. Um, but the church is the best place to feel that. And I think after you turn 18, there is a different turn. Uh, if you're not married, if you're, you know, not pursuing a fantastic career, if you're still trying to figure things out, sometimes it can be hard to feel like you have a place in church. And um, that's one of the things that Rock Point decided that we were going to make sure we had. And I think every church should make sure that they have some type of ministry for young adults to feel uh, like they are being cared for because, um, yeah, man, it's the future of the church. So. That would probably be my first answer. Yeah. I love that. And what, as you create space for the young adults in Arizona and the ministry that you lead, what are you seeing and learning just among the young adults that you've come alongside? Like, what are those two things of seeing and learning? Like, what are the things that are being magnified right now in the season that you guys are in? Mm. The the Probably the biggest one out here in Arizona is finances is tough. Um now, I don't know if all of our young adults would has have vocalized that they struggle with it, um, but in Arizona, specifically in Queen Creek, it's it's pretty tough. Um, I want to say our inflation rate got to like nineteen mm -hmm. percent from within the last year or two years or so. Um, so cost of living is crazy, and the average earnings of a young adult is not to where it needs to be. I saw that an average an average person in Arizona needs to make like $92,000 a year to be like able to live like how they really want to live. And young adults aren't making that. And so there's a lot of financial stress in our area and being able to, you know, handle that well. And I was just talking to our financial, uh, not advisor, but our financial director here yesterday just about it i'm like hey man like i want to be able to help our young adults in that way and he really said like you know 20 percent of it is head knowledge like we all know what to do um but 80 percent of it is that like heart knowledge of not doing what you're you know you're supposed to do mm -hmm. always looking forward to what's going on and in, in the future like do i really want my family to be in this financial situation or do i want you know my marriage to to be this or that going forward so it's uh yeah finances is, is tough and i think there's some other things too that tend to be hindrances uh for young adults like whatever's going on in society and whatnot totally i might just try hitting oh okay you're moving now there's lagging, that's all. There is a point right here. Can you hear us okay? I can hear you. Yeah, yeah. Okay, perfect. You're, yeah, it was lagging for a second, and I got like kind of lost in, in the combo because you guys were frozen. I was like, where'd you go? <laughs> but we're good now. We're good now. Okay, we lost you right at, um, you were talking about 20% head knowledge, 
80% hard knowledge. Do you, can you run that last part back and we'll, we'll try to get it. Yeah. In. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, my, our finance director was talking about how really when it comes to money, it's that 20% head knowledge. And then it's about 80% heart knowledge And the heart is like not doing those impulse buys. It's not, uh, it's being able to handle your money correctly and looking forward towards the future. And he said, in generally, when it comes to finances, there's only two ways. It's your income and then your expenses. Like there's, there's only two levers to pull on. And he said, like being able to invest and being able to look towards the future, that's so important for us in our finances. But as he was talking, I think that's the that might be one of the biggest things that I think in young adult ministry, especially as leaders, but also as young adults, what they struggle with a lot is being able to take their view off of right now and put it towards the future, which is why I say things like you guys aren't, you know, just the church. Now you're the church in the future. Um, but also like, if you want to have strong marriages, if you want to have strong families, if you want to have strong kids, what are the disciplines you need to start doing right now for that? Uh, financially, what are the investments? How, how should you handle your money? What should you be saving for? Um, so I think that's one of the largest ones that I see is being able to take your eyes off of right now, be able to put it on the future, because, man, there's so much waiting for you in the future if you can just think about it right now. What can you do today to better your tomorrow? 100%, man. Before you brought it up even, while you're unpacking just the challenge that it is financially in 2024, inflation, of course, um, just the economy coming out of a pandemic, there's a lot of factors, but who inflation hits is it it impacts everyone but man young adults and young families are gonna feel um the cost of living sometimes the highest as if you're gonna make appliance purchases if you're gonna make home purchases and some of like the defining decade decisions of getting married home ownership jobs starting to save for retirement all of those disciplines and decisions that mm -hmm. kind of hit that critical juncture of young adulthood. And, and I think why it's important to be young and debtless and why it's important for leaders to really minister holistically with young adults and their finances is what Jesus said with where your treasure is there, your heart is also. And I think what's at stake is the future, because if you want healthy marriages, healthy families, parenting, all of that can stem back to family of origin and mm -hmm. then young adults. And I mean, that's a passion point of mine. I think just because being in ministry, like Micah and I did not get in ministry because of the paycheck. In fact, there was other dreams that we laid down because, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes in ministry, there's just not that same income level that there would be in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. yeah, and sure. I'm grateful that at a young age, I was 16 taking college classes and working, saving for college. And a couple of those decisions early on helped me graduate with no student loans. And I want that for young adults because we were able to be missionaries for a season on a college campus. We were able to launch a nonprofit without the, the strings of debt holding us back, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. And um, money is simply a tool. It's also a good thermometer of where our heart's at. But it's one of those tools that if you get right, can set you up to build for God's kingdom. And if we miss it, in finances, it can really hinder some of what, mm -hmm. what our own desires are or God's plans and, and he provides. But man, I'll say this of Rock Point Church. I've been there a few times and just from the space, the building, Queen Creek, Arizona, but some of the things like when you get there, um, is it Tuesday nights or Thursday nights? I forget. Thursday nights. Yeah. Okay. So Thursday nights when I've been there, it's like the coolest coffee shop or restaurant outside feel and young adults are just hanging out they're playing bags they're maybe having a coffee it's it's summer so people are chilling and there's fans and you know i just i was impressed with the space both inside and outside but i think just you and i've talked about what could the church in the future look like and i think it's going to be people can find content online for sermons people can find yeah. worship in their home, 
or a car. But what people really want is the community, the people of God, the discipleship, mentorship, spiritual leadership. And so with that, I mean, take us to what is Rock Point Young Adults all about and what does it look like on a Thursday or the other days of the week too? Yeah. Um, young Adults at Rock Point is, I, I, I mean, I'm still doing it. I've been here for like five years now. I love it. Uh, yeah, we run on Thursday nights at 7. Uh, we used to be 7.30, uh, but our young adults, are get, they get, got a little bit older, and so they work a little bit earlier. So we moved up to 7 a couple of years ago. Um, and so we, we've been doing that now at 7 for, I think, two years. And it's it's been great. But, you know, our, our big heart, like I said before, is to make sure that these young adults, know that they're not, you know, just the church tomorrow, they're the church today too. And so how we structure our Thursday night is uh, it would probably be very similar to what you would think of like a weekend service, but we make it very much more, I think, easy to attend. One of our uh, like kind of big mantras that we say is uh, we always want young adults to be a space where runners can come home. So we don't want to make it a barrier for any young adult who's kind of run away from the church to be able to step on campus and make it feel like this feels a little bit different than church. Um, we're a little bit more natural, a little less programmatic with how it feels and how it looks. We don't use fancy lighting. We don't do that. It's very warm. Um, and so you kind of walk in and like the hope is that you're like, oh, oh, this is a little bit different than I thought it was going to be. Uh, we still have worship. We still have teaching. Uh, but during the night, there's different moments for them to break out and just kind of catch up on life. So there's always kind of a question that they talk about with different people sitting around them. And it's it's always cool. I, I get to jump off the stage and join a group every week and just chat, get to know part of the room. And, you know, with the room of uh, like 250 to 300 young adults on a Thursday night, like it's really cool to see community being built and something that we've said for a while now is like, I know you come to church for worship. I know you come to church for teaching, uh, but you also just come to church for the people. You shouldn't just come to church and, you know, just take it. We, this, we do this thing together and the church was always about the people, never about the building. So um, yeah. So we, we come in and hang out for usually like a couple hours uh, from about seven to usually eight thirty is when our service is over. And yeah, we always have a snack after, have everybody hang out, got free coffee, free tea, free, uh, any kind of drinks like that. So it's a fun vibe. I agree. Our space is great. And our campus and our executive team and leadership here know that, that this is a highly growing and affluent area. So our building should look like that too. And a decent amount of people literally come to church for the first time because they're like, I didn't realize that that building was a church and mm -hmm. I wanted to check it out. Um, so it's really cool. We're actually building a, a kid's building right now on our campus and it's like massive. It's just as big as like our main worship center building. It's crazy. Um, but we need it cause we have like over 1200 kids on the weekend right now. So we get, they gotta, we gotta have somewhere to go for all, all those kids. So yeah, our, our, our leadership here really knows what they're doing when it comes to that type of stuff. And I, I feel blessed to be a part of leading young adults here. So. I think that's so fun to hear that you can appreciate where you're at because some people look where they are and where they could be. But when you're in the middle of the story, it's just like it's fun to see like what God's doing, how you're able to utilize your building in the spaces and create a space that people want to check out and want to be, not have to be, oh, I have to go to church today. And like, oh no, I get to go to church today. That's my building. That's our building. This is our young adult ministry. That's where mm -hmm. my children attend or whatever it is. And it's it's fun to see that churches are catching on to that and that they're not lagging behind in the sense of we don't have the finances or the resources or the money or we don't have the people problem of we're bursting at the seams. Like those are all good things. So when it comes to just the problems at large, what do you find, um, Hunter, that maybe what is your greatest pain point as a young adult ministry in leader, or you can take it any way you want to go, but what is, what do you find to be your greatest pain point currently? Mm. Oh man. Thankfully, like my, my wife and I are in a really, really good season of ministry and nothing crazy has, has gone on. Um, so there's nothing like big in the current moment. Um, I think my biggest pain point is just in conversations that I have with young adults. Uh, 
for the most part, there's always an undertone or even like a, like someone brings it up that there's some sort of anxiety or worry that they're having. And it, it kind of hits me in, in different ways when I'm like, dang, like in all the conversation I've had this week with young adults, there's been uh worry and anxiety and fear. And it, I think it's difficult to be able to minister at times in to a, a group of people like Gen Z who I think have felt the most pressure upon them. And I'm not going to say of any generation, but at least within the last 30, 40 years, um, they, there's so much pressure on them to be able to perform and uh, be perfect and all of that. And um, to help them out and help them see that um, is, is difficult at times, but when you finally get to it's, it's pretty incredible. Um, if it's more of a pain point for, for me, um, I've been, I teach a lot and I have a lot of opportunities to do that here at rock point, which is awesome. Um, but I think being able to find time with my people, uh, when it comes to like my leaders and our coaches and stuff like that, and not forget the why of why we do everything. And like, I'm also putting as much time into our, my people as I am my messages um, yeah. and building up my people as much as I'm building up my content. Um, I think that that's always a struggle to be able to, um, you know, like people over maybe a task. And yeah, I think that's more of like the most tangible pain point. And I don't know if it's a problem to solve. I think it's more of just like attention to manage of there's attention. Of, you know, I, I teach almost every Thursday. Um, I bring in guest speakers all the time, but for a pain point, I think always remember to prioritize the people over the, you know, maybe making this illustration as good as possible, um, which there's, there's a pro and con to both of those, but yeah, I think, does that answer your question, Micah? Yeah, that's great. Thanks for being vulnerable and going going there. Because I think a lot of our listeners, when you are leading and teaching and preaching and you're wearing multiple hats or your ministry is growing and you're trying to develop your lead teams and groups and just special events and weekly events, like I think a lot of the, the audience can probably relate to that. And then on top of that, the people that you've developed with like leadership coaches and people, then it's like, what are your personal needs as a pastor? Like, who are your mm -hmm. friends outside of the ministry you are leading. And that's just always a really complicated and fine, weird, gray line to kind of just walk through. I mean, Josiah and I both started doing ministry when we were in our early twenties and you discover soon when there's a transition in your life where you get married or you personally start dating or you have kids that you attract different groups of people in the process, but you really find out who your friends are. Like, who were you a pastor mm -hmm. to? Who were you a mentor to? Who were you discipling? And who was just a sheep in the, in the, you know, in the fields that you were leading and they're all good things, but it's like, even I think pastors are lacking the relationships outside of their marriages and their families when it comes to who are the deep, meaningful friendships that aren't doing ministry day in and day out with you, whether it's on staff or they're part of the volunteer team. So yeah, that's so good. It is so good. And especially yes to, I think a common pain point for young leaders is like, who are my friends who mm -hmm. like, not just who am I their pastor, but mm -hmm. like the deep, meaningful relationships that you were talking about. The one that's unique, actually, as I talk to a lot of young adult pastors and leaders, sometimes they have the exact opposite pain point is what you just described, which mm -hmm. is not bad or I, it's just, it's fascinating. Hunter, what would you say to somebody who's 26 years old, they feel a call to ministry to preach and teach God's word. There's that fire in the belly, but in their home church, there just isn't those reps to teach mm. and to preach that you're actually um, blessed to have. Yeah. Oh man. Um, I think I was, I was listening to John Mark Comer the other day and he brought up that whenever preaching is used in the Bible, it was not used necessarily always in a teaching category. He said, preaching was more general. He said, when you get the gospel towards you, preaching is what we're supposed to do. This is every person's responsibility. Um, and so I think like having confidence, knowing that everyone should be able to preach, um, but not everyone is called to teach necessarily from God's word and 
unveil the mysteries of of the word as, as the bible says um but i think for a 26 year old who really wants to get out there and be able to teach um just start writing some messages like start putting some stuff together listen to some people about uh communication like um when, when i talk to young adults who don't see like we we brought it up almost in this whole podcast but like to be able to see the future like in the way that they maybe should it's like well what can you do today what can you do today to help that out? Like, can't so for this twenty-six year old, I'm gonna name him uh or name him David. So David, if you're wondering like uh how to get out there, um man, just start like learning what is communication. How do you do it well? Buy some books, listen to some YouTube videos, follow some pastors who you think teach really well. What are the principles that they use and how do they teach illustrations? And uh, almost come really ready when that opportunity presents itself so that you don't come and then you start doing the work. Um, you come in full force like, yeah, I've, I'm actually confident in knowing how to do this. Um, when, when I was in college, my uh, professor, he was like asking me like what I wanted to do. And I was like, dude, I'd love to be in ministry in some way, love to teach God's word and all that. And he was like my advisor at the time. We were getting my, my classes for next semester. And he was like, well, no, what do you really want to do? And I'm like, well, I, I just told you. And he was like, no, do you want to be a pastor? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I want to be a pastor. He's like, okay. He's like, what, we're, what you're going to learn in school is not really going to help you do that. You're going to learn a lot of things and you're going to learn a lot of stuff. Um, but when you walk out at times, you won't learn like the practical ministry stuff, how to write, how to do a budget, how to have hard conversations, all that. You kind of learn that on the fly. He's like, but what you can do in school is you can get all the biblical knowledge and all of the skills and all of that. Um, so he's like, what do you want to do? Do you want to take these like practical ministry classes that are better for you in the real world? Or do you want to help yourself out right now and learn all these skills? So I jumped in the biblical studies route and he kind of illustrated it um, in this way. He was like, would you have a, rather have a really shiny gun and really rusty bullets or really shiny bullets and a rusty gun? He's like, which performs better? And he was, I was like, yeah, the one with, one with better bullets. He's like, yeah, it does. It's like, you can always get a better gun. You can't always get better bullets. So he was like, yeah, do that. So that would be my, I guess, uh, comment to a 26 year old who hopes that he could teach one day. Just start now. Yeah. Maybe even do it for like some stuffed animals that you have in a room. Teach to them <laughs> and see, see how see how it sounds. Uh, you never know what God will do with like faithfulness today. So, for sure, the faithfulness today part we're passionate about. I'd say also there are environments primarily with like little children, like kids ministry. They're looking oh, yeah. for teachers every single week at most churches mm -hmm. and then the elderly like senior adult min ministries or um, retirement communities there are places it just might not be center stage on a sunday or wednesday or thursday oh, yeah. no, 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 um, yeah. but i think it's so profound and then you know i, I think the other piece because that's a really common question that i get and you're mm -hmm. i think you're in a rare spot that your leadership has just said hey go preach the word. Um, and, and it's in a young adult setting, I'd say, man, like there's a difference between wanting to say something or wanting to be seen saying something mm -hmm. and then developing something to say, having that lingering presence with the Holy spirit, that there is that fire in your belly so that when the opportunity comes, you're studied, you're well-researched, you're ready to go. And um, speaking of being ready to go, you up for the five and five, five final thoughts, I am. <laughs> five questions, five minutes with Hunter I Perry. Let's, let's do it. Let's go. That's one small step for man. Neil Armstrong sets foot on the moon. One giant leap for mankind. Sometimes one small step can lead to a giant leap. If you have a call to change the world for Christ, GFA World invites you to their Ministry Apprenticeship Program. Take one small step. Log on to gfa.org slash apprenticeship. Go to gfa.org slash apprenticeship. All right, question number one. Josiah, you kick it off. Okay, let us into your brain. What are you most excited about or learning about in 2024? The, the biggest thing that I heard this quote at the very beginning of the year, and it's, it sat with me for a while, uh, it was C.S. Lewis, and 
he said, we cannot lay down uh, what ought to be in us. We can only lay down what is in us. So when it comes to our life, when it comes to serving, we can only lay down what is in us, not what ought to be in us. And uh, I think of the story with, in Matthew 5, I think with the little boy who gives his lunch. He, that's all he could give. And I think at times that's how I feel. It's like, that's all I got. He's like, but that's all he wants. So um, I, I might feel like I need to grow in certain areas, but God's just asking me to to lay down what's in me, not what should be in me. So Come on, that's so yeah. good. Oh my gosh, we just end right there. But we're not going to because we have question number two. <laughs> Hunter, what is a hobby that you enjoy doing for fun? This is outside of ministry now. And ministry is fun, don't get me wrong, but what is a fun hobby? Something that I do that I don't get to do as much anymore. Um, I love music. I love playing and guitar i love singing um and like i used to try and make my own music but now uh i don't have as much time to do that so sometimes i'll, I'll bust out the guitar at home and, and play a little bit um i get to play every now and then but not all the time we'll get you some stuffed animals to practice with <laughs> yeah in I know, front right? of. <laughs> thankfully i have a wife who loves to listen to me play guitar so oh that that's works. so good <laughs> okay here's the curveball I'm sure you're ready for it. If you could ask Mike and I anything, I don't know what you're going to throw us, but it keeps us engaged on our toes, ready in season and out of season. So bring it. What, what do you want to know? Mm. Um, what was the most beneficial thing that you did in your 20s for your faith? Mm. You want to go? Sure. The most beneficial thing that I did in my 20s for my faith was get around people who were fired up about God, getting around people who shared that same passion, seeking God together in that community. Um, there was different groups. There was different Bible studies. There was church. There was different people's houses that come to mind. Mm -hmm. But um, having people to run with in the same direction Oh my gosh. Um, I think of probably my two best friends outside of Micah. We really got close in my late teenage years, early twenties, and we're best friends to this day. And mm -hmm. they're both about five years older than I am, but just having, um, it's, it's literally, there was friends, there was best friends, there was mentors, there was pastors and people that I could go to with questions, people that I could pray with and, and partner their faith with mine, believing that our friends were going to come to know Jesus. Um, but man, even, even like the church I was at didn't have a young adult ministry. And maybe the most beneficial thing that I did for my faith in my 20s was ask my pastor what we could do about that. And he hmm. let me start a young adult ministry. And it was wild as I saw other people's faith growing. Man, that did something for my own desire and delight and affections and the fire that was within me too. That's mm. good. That reminds me of something that you told me one time, Josiah. It's like, it's not often that people that are the same age as you will open doors for you. It's usually the people that are older than you that open doors for you. But to add to I think what you said, run through those doors with people not just yourself. That's, That's good. So good. Yeah. I think personally for me was trusting the mentors and pastors and people that I had in my life in my early twenties, trusting what they saw in me as leadership mm. and allowing myself to discover that and not be like, not run away from it. Cause there's so many people that will be like, Mike, I see leadership all over you. I see ministry all over you. I see your heart for people, young adults. I see all these things. And it's just like, okay, I could either, either have run from that, or I could have leaned into that. And I think when you mm. surround yourself with people and leaders and pastors and um, mentors who are speaking into those areas of your life, or maybe only seeing you from a distance, but then like pull you aside and say, Hey, we see this quality. Um, is this an area that you want to grow in? Cause there's an opportunity for that here. So I think mm -hmm. just trusting the process. And when you're, when I was put in those positions, it did increase my faith. Cause I'm like, yeah, because I was an introvert. Like I am, I'd be behind the scenes. I don't care. I don't need to be seen, whatever. Um, but I hated public speaking. I hated all those different things. And I think I, God's really, I don't know, changed my heart set towards those more or mm -hmm. less. But if I wouldn't have had those people brave and bold enough to speak out and call out the greatness, 
I don't know where my faith would be. I don't know where that would be like in ministry. I probably wouldn't even be in something like this. So I would say what's increased the faith in addition to that is having friends that you're praying through the seasons with. I think that is something mm. that really has kept me going that are people that are maybe not necessarily in ministry, but would gather for two years every single day praying for our future spouses that I could still call to this day and say, hey, this is what's going on. And they live eight to 10 hours away. So I think when you have those things in place in your 20s, it just continues to grow as time goes on. And some of those things die out. I mean, some of those friendships you kind of outgrow or they go their way and you go yours. But there's also an opportunity for deeper depths and intimacy with them as well through friendship. So that's so yeah. good. That's so cool. That's what I would say. So 20s cultivate. It's definitely a season of planting and watering and and growing, enjoying the crop later, probably. Feels, Phenomenal it feels, question. It oh, feels like sure. a lot in the moments, but all right. Question number four, what's one place that you wish you could take your wife and travel? Mm. It's, it's such a weird question because for some reason, I don't want to go out of the country like at all. You don't have and to. I think that's, I think, I know. I think it's just like a current season. Our, my mother-in-law makes fun of us. It's like, you never want to go anywhere. I'm like, no, I'm just comfortable going to California and back. Um, <laughs> but, uh, I've never been to Italy and I'd love to go. So somewhere over there getting some fresh Italian food and, you know, like the one where like this, like the owner is the chef. He cooks it himself, runs over like across the street to the grocery store, brings it back and cooks it for me. Like something like that. That's called the Hallmark yeah, movie. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Oh, I'm just kidding. Oh. I don't know if Hallmark could afford going to Italy, though. They usually stay in small towns. Oh, but they can perform some pretty good ones. We they always do. know how it's going to turn do. out. Over and over and over. Hey, and there's people like it. me That's that awesome. keep watching it. I don't know why. Hey, I love end. it. I love it. I love it. We need it. We we need that kind of content out today, you know? You we know, do. one could say that Hallmark movies are a lot like good preaching. It's followable. It's a True. little bit predictable. It's you can kind of see where it's going. It's engaging in that regard. But mm -hmm. man, we've had an awesome conversation about young adults reimagining things, future leaders, the church. Um, grateful for you. It, Hunter, if you if we gave you the mic and said, hey, could you encourage a group of young leaders, what would you want them to find out today? Mm. Uh, one of the best lessons that I learned was in college, our college football coach, our, our mascot was the bison. And he said, there's a fundamental thing about a bison where when there's a storm coming, uh, there's this thing about them where it's like Greek word, sterizo, where instead of running around a storm, they, they run through it because it's the quickest way to get through. Um, and so what I would say is like, regardless of what you're facing today, uh, just keep moving forward and go through it. You're, you don't know what life's going to look like in two years, five years, 10 years. And, uh, but, but I know you will be thankful for the, the current faithfulness that you had today. Um, so don't underestimate what God can do right now with, uh, with faithfulness because tomorrow he might have something new for you at a different door. So just be faithful today and keep moving forward. That's what I always got to remind myself of. Just keep moving forward. I love God it. God honors that. That's one of my favorite things about the bison, whether people know that or not. I'm from North Dakota, so I did know that. So yeah, I love <laughs> I it. I love it. I that love it. We got to be those people. That will preach. That was new for me today and probably for the listener or person watching on YouTube. But Hunter, we're grateful for you, man. Well, thank you. I really appreciate this. Well, thank you for tuning in and listening. This is the Young Adults Today podcast, and we were joined by Hunter Perry. Man, we enjoyed that conversation so much, and we want to give you a free gift. It's an ebook, 10 Steps to Starting a Successful Young Adult Ministry. It's linked in the show notes for free as a listener of this podcast. And all you need to do is visit www.youngadults.today for you, for your pastors, for your leadership teams, for your volunteers, 10 Steps to Starting a Successful Young Adult Ministry. When you visit youngadults.today. Thanks for tuning in to the show. We'll see you back here next week.